Our next session is obviously Law and Lightning. Um, this teacher is a graduate of NYU Law. He is the director of research at Coin Center. How many of you are familiar with Coin Center? Oh yeah, if you're not, you should be. You wanna be, believe me. Um, it's the leading nonprofit research and advocacy group focused on public policy issues facing cryptocurrency technologies. Um, he's testified before Congress. He's briefed staff, member, staff and members of the EU Parliament and educated policy makers and regulatory staff around the world on the subject of cryptocurrency regulation and decentralized computing systems. It is my absolute great pleasure to introduce you to uh, Peter Van Balkenberg today. Thanks Thank so you, much. Peter, for being here. Thanks, Pamela. Well, thanks for having me. Um, as Pamela said, uh, the talk I'm going to give today is about the Lightning Network primarily. But it's really broadly about two reports that we've published this past year on coincenter.org and that we've um, been distributing around Washington, D.C. to anybody who takes an interest in these things. One is the case for electronic cash by Jerry Brito, who's the executive director of Coin Center, uh, my organization, where we make the moral and ethical policymaker uh, case to convince people that electronic cash systems that actually offer bearer uh, instrument like payments person to person are essential to the long term flourishing of human dignity and, 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 and personal autonomy. Uh, so I'll go through some of that. Um, and then the other paper is Electronic Cash, Decentralized Exchange, and the Constitution, where we say, okay, we've, we've made the moral ethical case why these technologies are important, but there's also, from a legal perspective, it's important to make the case that restrictions on these technologies might not even be constitutional if the government was to go down a road to say you can't develop software that does X, Y, and Z. Would that be constitutional? in the US under the First and Fourth Amendments to our Constitution. So we outline all of those arguments in that paper. So these two papers um, are what I'm going to describe quickly today. And obviously, if any of this is interesting to you, please check out the full versions with lots of legal citations and case uh, analysis and things like that. So uh, Pamela already did a, a great job explaining what we do. We're a nonprofit based in Washington, D.C. We are not a trade association. We're not like an industry association. We're just a think tank whose mission is independently set by its board of directors and by its staff to defend the freedom to innovate using these technologies. We don't want to work for any company that might be using these technologies, even though our interests are often aligned, and so we get support from a lot of exchanges. We want to really defend the fundamental technology, not any particular company. We've got three full-time uh, attorneys and three other full-time staff members, so it's actually a surprisingly large team to be dedicated to working on these issues in DC, where there really aren't too many people uh, spending time on them. And what we do is education of policymakers, education of lawyers, research into hard questions in the law and how they intersect with cryptocurrency, and then we advocate for policy solutions. So if Congress is thinking of doing something or the SEC is thinking of interpreting existing law in a certain way, and we think that that interpretation would either be good or bad, we'll advocate for our chosen um, solution to a policy question, which is always, again, to maximize the freedom to innovate using these technologies and not put up unnecessary barriers to people's use. Um, so, starting with the case for electronic cash, as I said, a lot of what we do is briefings in front of congressional staff or regulatory staff, and I'm starting this part of our presentation by describing a briefing we did last February for uh, members of the House of Representatives staffs, especially House Financial Services Committee, because they were interested in how these payment technologies work and how they're regulated. And it's always been difficult for us to demo these things before Congress, because if you just pull up a website like Kraken or Coinbase, or even if you pull out a hardware wallet, it just looks like a USB thumb drive to them. And the website just looks like online banking. You know, if it's well designed, it should look like online banking. It's just Bitcoin instead of dollars. So it's not actually very exciting. I mean, think of my job as compared to the job of like somebody who advocates for good drone policy, and they can take the congressman out and play with a drone. It's a lot more exciting <laughs> than like, hey, look, this is like online banking, but it's cooler because it, it supports freedom, and all that happens on the back end, which is a bunch of ones and zeros that I can't show you, but trust me. 
So we were really excited to have an actual demo for a change, thanks in large part to the Lightning Network. So we have this uh, M&M dispenser, and this is Jerry, our executive director, making a payment from a Lightning-enabled wallet on his phone to a Lightning-enabled wallet that's connected to the candy dispenser. And this is, this is just, I mean, it's not as sexy as a drone or a Tesla to show a member of Congress, but it is important because it gets something across that's hard to get across. Unlike any other electronic payment, this payment through the Lightning Network, and ultimately settled one day to Bitcoin through the Lightning Network, is peer-to-peer. -peer. It happens without reliance on any intermediary in between. The Bitcoins are in a wallet that is sitting on Jerry's phone, and they're being sent to a wallet that literally is attached to that candy machine. No one needs to be trusted to make that payment go through. It works just like putting a coin into a candy machine. And a lot of people, even people in Congress, don't realize that every other form of electronic payment, credit cards, ACH, SWIFT, they don't work that way. They work through one or several intermediaries who can stop the payment if they don't like the payment, who can analyze the data of the payment if they want to like, learn more about who's buying what. All of those other electronic payment systems have middlemen, and this one doesn't. And so the point is, it's cash. It's cash, but for the internet. And that is fundamentally important for three main reasons from a policymaker standpoint, from a moral ethical standpoint. It's good for innovation and interoperability, it's good for efficiency and scale and economies, and it's, this is the big one, essential for privacy and autonomy in human society. So I'll quickly go through these things, just so you get a gist of the moral arguments, so that when you're talking to people about why you're excited about this technology, you can point to some things that might persuade a policymaker, or might persuade a lawyer, or maybe you are a lawyer and this is interesting to you because you're that kind of person. So why innovation and interoperability? Well, this should hopefully be familiar to you if you've attended other sessions here or at other Bitcoin conferences or Ethereum conferences. The whole point is that in the old world, pre-internet, we had a couple of siloed institutions that would allow you to send a message. And you'd have to send a message only if you got approval from them, like the, tele the, the television broadcaster has to say, yeah, sure, I'm willing to broadcast that. And you can only send a message in the format or the medium that that particular intermediary wants the message sent. So you can't use the television airwaves to send a, a website. You can send a, a television program, and that's it. So you're limited in the format of what you can send and in the content, because the broadcaster has to agree that that content should be sent. And the revolution of the internet for innovation and interoperability was to say, screw that. We'll just replace these intermediaries with a new purpose agnostic protocol for communications. That means that anybody who understands how to code in TCP IP and send messages over the TCP IP protocol can send messages. They can have any content, there's no gatekeeper, and they can be in any format, which means if you want to send things that are basically like mail, you can invent SMTP, the mail transfer protocol, for email and send mail messages over TCP IP. But if you want to send websites over TCP IP, you could invent the World Wide Web, like Tim Berners-Lee. Similarly, you could do voice over IP, which is now actually how all phones work. They all now travel over the internet, the, the, the voice data. And if you want to build hardware that interconnects with this new purpose agnostic communications network, you don't need permission from anyone. You just make your hardware compatible. So when Steve Jobs wanted to reinvent what it was to have a phone, he didn't need to worry about it being compatible with the internet, he just needed to know how to write in internet standards. And then apps get built on top of phones, and that is the story of the internet that we all now celebrate, and we recognize was a major creator of jobs and growth in the US in the 2000s. And so the goal of cryptocurrencies and open blockchain networks that run on cryptocurrencies is to take any remaining centralized systems and create free and open peer-to-peer -peer alternatives. So here's another bundle of centralized gatekeepers that we'd love to maybe replace with a purpose agnostic platform. And one of those, right now the most successful, is Bitcoin. And that is also just an open standard. And that's why people can develop further software that makes it work better or different in a second layer. And that's the Lightning Network built on top of Bitcoin. And then 
anybody who understands how to write lightning compatible software can create hardware or websites or payment applications that can process payments over the lightning network, like our candy machine. And this is the wacky guy who actually built the candy machine. His name is David Nezik. He happens to live in Switzerland. He was tweeting about his tinkering experiments with this. He had an Arduino and a cheap candy machine from Amazon, and he downloaded the right software libraries, and he started posting pictures of all this, and we found it because somebody shared it with, with Coin Center, and, said, and we reached out to David and said, hey, that's awesome. Is it working? Can we have one to show Congress? And he said, sure, I'll make three more, and I'll send one to you, and I'll send one to, you know. And the, the, the key here is he didn't have to have permission from anyone to do this. He didn't have to even have any kind of certification or anything. He just had to know how to write the right software using open source libraries, and then suddenly he can make an internet-connected device, an IoT device that can accept lightning payments. He doesn't have to open an account with Bank of America as like a merchant or have a credit card even. All he needs to do is find commonly available hardware and free and open source software. That is a story about innovation. And yeah, this is kind of a silly thing, but so many things could be payment enabled easily if built on top of the Lightning Network. And we're going to see a flowering of that over the next uh, five, 10 years. So what about this efficiency and scale and economies argument? So why is Bitcoin with the Lightning Network more efficient and scalable than traditional payments? Well, it's because traditional payments, ACH, SWIFT, Fedwire, all these things are still fundamentally analog. So banks might have some internally digital processes, but the process of reconciling one bank's accounts with another are still fundamentally analog. So if you want to pay somebody who doesn't have the same bank as you, which is most of the time when you want to pay somebody, you're going to have to go through multiple intermediaries, and they're going to have analog processes, reconciling accounts, and the whole thing will take about two days if you're lucky. And that's ridiculous. And so this should not be new to you, but the revolution of Bitcoin and of open blockchain networks is to say, well, what if we just replace several siloed proprietary databases and ledgers with one singular ledger, the blockchain? and then have copies of that blockchain shared by anybody who wants to on the open network, and they work in consensus to figure out whether something should, is valid, should be added to the ledger or not, whether a transaction should be added. And the Lightning Network is another free and open protocol that basically, and this is how I explain it, it might be helpful to you when you explain Lightning to your friends, allows people to do sort of batch settlement to the blockchain, where you don't need to make a transaction for, to the blockchain for every transaction that you want to actually accomplish between people. You just batch them up. So you only need to have one transaction to the Bitcoin blockchain to do maybe 1,000 transactions between persons. But the thing that's better about traditional batch settlement, like what real-time growth settlement is at, 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 at the major financial institutions, is that you don't have to trust anyone to do this because you can always fall back to the underlying protocol through the smart contract if the person who was doing the batching was to walk away or behave dishonestly. So you don't have to trust them, which is fantastic. And is this efficient and does this scale? Well, so far, yes. So those candy machine payments we were making in front of Congress, the fee for each payment to the candy machine was 0 0.000036 per payment. That's unfathomably small as a fee. It's um, 1 250th of a penny. So put another way, you could pay the candy machine 250 times and still only pay one cent in total fees across all those transactions. This is radically better. In order to just kind of freak out the staffers in Congress, we made each dispensing of the candy machine 0.9 cents. You can't even make that payment in physical cash because you're not going to divide a penny into tenths. But you can do it using the Lightning Network, and it's economical because the fee is still radically smaller than even 0.9 cents payment. But remember I said that it's really only expensive to use traditional financial payments if you're paying someone who doesn't have the same bank as you. The fact of the matter is there's parts of the world, and I'm going to use Shanghai as an example, 
where just about everybody has the same financial institution in between them. So just about everyone in Shanghai has WeChat on their phone, and just about everyone in Shanghai has Alipay on their phone, and both those services can be used to pay people. And so that means that just about everyone in Shanghai can pay anybody else going through just one intermediary, just through WeChat, just through Alipay. And that means that the payment is just WeChat or Alipay adjusting two numbers in their spreadsheet. That's cheaper than the Lightning Network will ever be. That's cheaper than anything because it's just two numbers in a spreadsheet. But there are hidden costs. So the point we really need to convey to policymakers and to lawyers who don't seem to understand what the use of this weird technology is, is that, yeah, there are other ways of doing efficient and fast payments, but they have a hidden cost. And that hidden cost is measured in loss of privacy and loss of personal autonomy. So has anyone visited China within the last three years, let's say? That's a lot. That's great. Did you see QR codes for payments? <laughs> They're everywhere now. Food stands have them. Actually, there you go. <laughs> Coconuts. <laughs> This is a, a musician who's taking tips for playing music using um, Alipay. This is not a protest, almost by definition, because <laughs> this is mainland China. Um, this is a bike you can rent. This is someone paying for medical services using a WeChat QR code. This is a library where you can check out books. It's a robot library, and you can pay using WeChat and Alipay. And so this is great. It's super fast and efficient. It is better than cash, except Alipay then knows where you are all the time, what you read all the time, if you're sick, lots more, and that also means that the Chinese government knows all that. And this isn't me being conspiratorial. Alipay and WeChat have been extremely clear. We share all our data with the government. We're happy to. It's part of our duty. And the Chinese government has been very clear what it wants to do with all that data. They want to rate every citizen, give them a social credit score, Not just like a credit score, like how good your lending and borrowing practices have been, but a social credit score, like how good of a citizen have you been lately based on what you've been buying and what you've been doing with yourself. And there's no opt-out option because every time you use these payment methods, that data is collected and inputted into your score. You don't get a choice. There's no choice. This is a, an Alipay technical director says that Someone who plays video games for 10 hours a day, for example, would be an idle person, whereas someone who buys diapers is probably a parent and probably has a better sense of responsibility. This was in relation to how they're going to do scoring. I mean, those are some pretty subjective value judgments, right? So discounts might be part of it, but this is the big part of it. Low scores, when your score gets too low, means slower internet speeds, restricted access to restaurants, nightclubs, golf courses, and the removal of the right to travel freely abroad. And already in China, over a million people are banned from taking high-speed trains within China or traveling on planes domestically or abroad. And so this is a really frightening future that we're headed towards, because it's not just China. People are using electronic payments in the US, and they're relying on centralized services that collect all that data. And when those services decide to lock your account because they didn't like something you did, or they got pressure from their government to, to lock your account, it might mean that you simply can't participate in economic life until they decide to unlock your account. Sure, you might be able to use cash instead, but In most countries, physical cash is actually disappearing, and several people are advocating for the end of physical cash, as if it's a good thing, because it's clearly only used for crime. And it prevents us from having negative interest rates. And so this is a chart of how much cash represents as a percentage of the total country's GDP. In Sweden, there are people now growing up who don't even know what their local currency looks like, their physical currency, because they only use electronic payment methods. And so our point is that reliance on private intermediaries to punish people who behave badly through payments censorship, locking your account, it can't be reconciled with the rule of law. The rule of law says that for someone to be punished, they first have to be guilty of a crime. So the law should describe the crime, 
you know, what are the elements of the crime, and then a judge and a jury should prove that they met those elements, and then they get punished. But the reality is when you do it through a corporate intermediary through payment censorship, there is no law stated, and there is no judge and jury aside from the choices of the corporation. So WikiLeaks is a controversial nonprofit these days because of, of you know, questions about involvement in election issues and other things. But the bottom line is, back when the Cablegate leaks happened, this is what Chelsea Manning leaked to WikiLeaks, they were just a registered nonprofit in the UK, right? Just doing what we want nonprofits to do, standing up for a, a purpose that they believe is for the betterment of society. And if you wanted to pay WikiLeaks after the Cablegate scandal using a credit card, you couldn't. Those transactions would just get blocked. Visa, MasterCard, American Express, all blocked. Now, that's not because US Congress passed a law that says we can't have donations to WikiLeaks anymore. In fact, such a law would probably be unconstitutional because it's your free speech rights to support a nonprofit if you believe in the mission. So why couldn't you pay using a credit card? You couldn't pay using a credit card because somebody in the US government had a conversation with somebody at Visa and somebody at MasterCard and somebody at American Express and said, hey, if you're a patriot, you're gonna stop processing these donations. And they did. And that's not how the rule of law is supposed to work. Whether you like WikiLeaks or not, that's not how society that is open and liberal and based on the rule of law is supposed to work. And I throw this in just for added um, emphasis even if you believe that your government is good, if the ability to cut people off from payments is something that's sort of arbitrarily held by a corporation, it's still a problem. Even if you believe that the corporation and the government that the corporation is in the jurisdiction of are good. Because a lot of this will be done algorithmically. So if you put, um, there was a guy who put Cuban sandwich in his Venmo payment uh, message field and his account was temporarily locked because Cuba was on the OFAC list. That's insane. This woman um, was being publicly shamed in this picture for jaywalking because they have facial recognition cameras in China at the intersections and her face kept ending up in the crosswalk when the don't walk sign was on. The problem is this woman was not jaywalking. She posed for an advertisement on the side of a city bus because she owns a company and it was an advertisement for her company and the bus was in the crosswalk when the don't walk sign was on. And so she immediately got flagged as a criminal worthy of public shaming. And now this got solved. Everyone can see what's going on and it's kind of funny, but that's really alarming if that's how justice is done. If it's all algorithmic and then can be enforced through arbitrary power within the corporate intermediaries that do payments or do whatever that Mediatron is. I also add this for emphasis, this I added recently to this presentation because I'm amazed that they keep adding features that make my job easier, frightening people about this. WeChat had an optional plugin you could install in the WeChat app that would show you a map, like Google Maps of your surrounding area, and show you people on that map who are nearby and owe a lot of money, like have bad credit scores. I don't, what am I even supposed to do with this data? Am I supposed to shun them? Am I supposed to turn them in? I don't know what I'm supposed to, it's really unsettling. And it's because they're being irresponsible with this data. Or maybe they think they're being responsible, which is almost even scarier, because what they're going for then is some sort of grand new order. I, I didn't subscribe to that. And so the point is that only digital cash systems like Bitcoin with a lightning network or any other open blockchain cryptocurrency can preserve a free and open alternative that can't be taken away by even the most unscrupulous corporation or corrupt government. And a lot of people who know how Bitcoin works will say, well, wait a minute, all payments in Bitcoin happen on the Bitcoin blockchain. And so we can mine that data. And that's very bad for privacy and human dignity too, isn't it? Because it's just sitting out there waiting for people to see who you paid using Bitcoin. And that's true, but this is why the newer technologies coming out in this space are really exciting. The Lightning Network being one of them. If there are thousands of transactions done through the Lightning Network settled to a single transaction on the blockchain, you don't know any details about those thousands of transactions just from looking at the blockchain. 
And there are new cryptocurrencies like Monero and Zcash and the Mimblewimble protocol like Beam and Grin that will allow for global verification of payments and censorship resistant payments without having all that public information on the blockchain. And that's why these innovations are important, even though some of them have the reputation of being associated with nothing but, say, money laundering or, or drugs. We need to change those perceptions. We need to say, no, actually, these are the technologies we need to build if we want to build things that are effectively the other side of the coin to what China and Alipay and WeChat are building. Free and open payment technologies, in short, embody liberal values. And so that's the moral ethic case for cryptocurrency. And that's that first report that I mentioned. The other topic that I want to cover today, and I'm going to go fast, is financial surveillance law, by which I mean uh, what Caitlin referred to in the last session as AML KYC laws. Um, the requirements for certain persons within the economy to know their customers, report their customer information to government, file suspicious activity reports, and all these sorts of things. How does the Constitution interact with those financial surveillance laws? And how is that interaction important for cryptocurrency developers and these technologies? So financial surveillance law, it's something that's global. It's not just a US thing. In the EU, you have the anti-money laundering directives. In the US, we have the Bank Secrecy Act is the, is the legislation that created these obligations. And there's a global body called FATF, the Financial Action Task Force, that tries to regularize anti-money laundering laws across the world, say that all countries should have the same basic standards of whose information needs to be collected, what information needs to be collected, and then reported to law enforcement and regulators. And so in the US, the Bank Secrecy Act is a law that's been around since 1970. And it basically does these things. It says, you need to register with FinCEN if you are a money services business. It also applies to banks, but money services business is the broadest category, so we'll just talk about that. You need to register with the regulator in, in DC. You need to keep records of who paid who on your platform. You need to have a risk calibrated anti-money laundering program. In other words, if you have if it, if it should have been evident to you that this was a money laundering transaction, you should have had processes involved to stop it and report it. And you need to do these reports. You need to file suspicious activity reports for transactions that are over $2,000 and suspicious. And you need to file currency transaction reports for any cash transaction that you intermediate that's over $10,000. And so the question for cryptocurrency folks is amongst a variety of actors in this space, miners, software developers, exchanges, and lightning nodes, or for that matter, people just running Bitcoin full nodes who aren't mining, are you a money services business? Because if you are, you have to register with FinCEN, you have to know your customer, which in some of these cases is hard to even understand, like who's the customer of someone on the Lightning Network? They're just a node on a protocol. And yeah, they're moving other people's money around, but in a trustless way. Are they their customers? And so obviously, if miners are deemed money services businesses and need to know the KYC information of everyone who, whose transactions they put in a block, Bitcoin wouldn't work. If nodes on the Lightning Network needed to know the customer information and names of everybody whose transactions they route through their Lightning channels, Lightning Network wouldn't work. Because these protocols don't deal with names, they deal with Bitcoin addresses, and they deal with time-locked smart contracts, and with you know, numbers and pseudonyms. And these protocols can't be bent to work with human-readable names, because who's going to validate that that name is that person, is that Bitcoin address? You've introduced a lot of squishy human processes into something that was an efficient open protocol that did all the good things we said it did in the previous section. Exchanges? Exchanges are money services businesses, because they're basically just like PayPal, but for Bitcoins instead of dollars. And so that makes sense, and it doesn't ruin their business model if they have to know their customers. Software developers? Software developers don't know who uses the protocols that they develop. They couldn't possibly know every, like, 
Greg Maxwell can't possibly know everyone who uses Bitcoin. And so if that was some kind of requirement, it would be the end of legally developing that software. I'm quite confident the software would still be developed, but we don't want to go down that road. And so the real question from a constitutional law standpoint now is, would regulating any of these parties as money services businesses trample on their constitutional rights to privacy or speech? And I think the answer is unequivocally yes in most cases. So what are the rights I'm talking about? Um, primarily, I'll deal with the US. It's the First Amendment, freedom of speech, and it's the Fourth Amendment, prohibition on warrantless search. And so let's start with warrantless search. The Fourth Amendment says that in most cases, if you want to search some private papers or effects of a person, you need to go to a judge and get a warrant that particularly describes the things you want to search and makes a case as to why the search is reasonable, because we suspect them of a crime, because we have this evidence already against them. So the Fourth Amendment generally says you can't search things unless you get a warrant. But the Bank Secrecy Act says if you're a money services business, which might just be a natural person acting as a money services business, you have to demand this information from your customers and hand it over to government as suspicious activity reports and KYC information just in bulk. There's no warrant. There's no particularized suspicion. It's not the government coming to you and saying, hey, I'd like the records that you keep on Peter Van Valkenburg because here's a warrant. It's the government saying, no, if you have Peter Van Valkenburg on a customer, you're always giving us his transaction history. How is that constitutional? Caitlin said she doesn't think it's constitutional, and, and I want to agree with Caitlin, although I also don't want to like, like, like flip a table in the middle of Congress and be like, this law since the 1970s is unconstitutional, we got to fight it. Maybe. We don't want to take on battles we can't win, but I do think we can win an easier battle which is to say that some of these entities are definitely not money services businesses, and applying money services businesses regulation to them would be unconstitutional. It's probably, it's probably constitutional if banks have to do it, although we can debate that, but it's definitely unconstitutional if you try to force miners to do it, if you try to force software developers to do it. And so quickly, here's the intuition as to why that would be the case. In the old days, most people transacted using cash. And to the extent there were records about those transactions, they were kept by the people who were paying or being paid. And so if government wanted to search those payment records, they would not be able to just do it. They'd have to go to a judge first, who's a check on their authority, and say, look, I have a reason to suspect this person. I want those records. And the judge could either say yes or no. This is the importance of warrants within open liberal societies. And the reason for that is that those papers are within something that the Supreme Court called our reasonable expectation of privacy. We have a reasonable expectation of privacy that the private accounting records we've kept of our cash transactions are private and should stay private. But of course, we don't use cash really anymore. This is the, the, the case that actually created that reasonable um, expectation of privacy standard. It's called CATS in 1969, before the Bank Secrecy Act in the 1970s. Now, nowadays, people don't use cash anymore. They use financial intermediaries, which means Bank of America has a record of everyone you've paid or who has paid you. Can government go search those records without a warrant? You betcha. Now, why is that constitutional? Well, the Supreme Court, in a case that actually dealt with the constitutionality of the Bank Secrecy Act, said it's constitutional because the subject of the search, one of these four people, has willingly and voluntarily handed over that information to a third party as part of that third party's legitimate business purposes. So you willingly hand over all your personal information to a bank when you open an account, and the bank has a legitimate reason to know all that information, because they need to know who you are in order to pay you the money that is owed to you. You've created that relationship voluntarily, and they have a legitimate reason to have that information. And so once you've released it out to a third party, it's outside of your reasonable expectation of privacy, because they could share it with other people, so why should you expect it to remain private? Now, you might disagree with that, but that's unfortunately constitutional law for the last um, 60 years, which is incredible. And not only that, not only do you not need a warrant, the Bank Secrecy Act, again, says 
the government doesn't even need to ask. It should just get the data automatically. Bank of America just sends it the data whenever it meets the, the definition of suspicious activity reports or currency transaction reports. And so this is uh, one of the two cases that established this third party doctrine. You don't have a legitimate expectation of privacy information, you voluntarily turn over to third parties. And this is the other case, this is the one that dealt with the Bank Secrecy Act that said that there's no seizure, um, the records are things that pertain to transactions to which the bank is itself a party. It's, they're the bank's records as much as the individual's records. So no constitutional protection for the individual. And these are again the two hooks for when you lose that warrant requirement. Are the records kept by the third party for a legitimate business purpose? And was the information in those records provided voluntarily by the person under investigation to the third party? So let's look now at better payment systems. Oh, that used to be Bitcoin, now it's Ethereum. Well, we're not shilling any of these. <laughs> so we know that when you make a payment using Ethereum or Bitcoin, records end up on the blockchain. You might have some records on your person, these are like your private keys and your wallet data, and then there are records on the blockchain, this is the actual valid transaction message that went to the blockchain. Now, can government get the transactions on the blockchain without a warrant? Yeah, of course, because basically it's like, that's how these systems work, they're message boards. You just like walk to the middle of the town square and said, this address pays this address. So it would be silly if the government needed a warrant to go to the town square and look at the stuff on the board. It's public blockchain, fine. Do they need a warrant if they wanna look at your personal computer and the wallet.dat file on it? You bet, that's, Pretty clear, and it, it better stay that way, right? So yes, you need a warrant there. But then we have all these other edge cases. What about an exchange? Now again, as I said earlier, exchanges are regulated as money services businesses. Why? Because they're basically PayPal for Bitcoin or Ethereum instead of dollars, and PayPal's a money services business. And they fit the definition of money services business. In the regulations, the definition is accepts and transmits currency or currency substitutes from one person to another. And that's what a proper exchange like Kraken or Coinbase does. They accept your Bitcoin, which you give to them, and you, then when you tell them to, they'll pay, they'll transmit to someone else. So hard to argue that they're not accepting and transmitting, and Bitcoin and Ethereum are definitely currency substitutes. And I think if you were to argue that they shouldn't be called currency substitutes, you'd sort of be shooting yourself in the foot as someone who wants these things to become widely used money. So exchanges are money services businesses, which means FinCEN and other regulators can get their records without a warrant, and in fact, they have to automatically report their records to government if there's suspicious activity and things like that. What about a miner? Miners, you know, they really only deal with public data, so you probably don't need a warrant to go to a particular miner and ask for their copy of the blockchain, because it's the same as any other copy of the blockchain, but that's a little odd. Miners might not have some unique information maybe about the transactions they put in the blockchain, because they, they could, might record which IP address on the peer-to-peer -peer network they, they heard the last broadcast of the transaction that they put in the blockchain. This is all complicated and, and probably not worth discussion. Um, What's important is that they are not money services businesses. They don't have to automatically report any information about their customers. They don't even need to know their customers um, to FinCEN. And this is actually something that FinCEN came out and said in 2014 in an administrative ruling. And we were very happy about this because we've spent a long time explaining these ideas to the folks at FinCEN. And fortunately, thus far, they've generally agreed. Now, what about networks where there just aren't any transaction data on the blockchain that's useful, like Zcash or Monero? Or you can even think of the Lightning Network in this context because there's a lot less in the public blockchain that's useful if transactions had been routed through the Lightning Network and batch settled, basically. That's my slide earlier. Well, here we have to ask ourselves, okay, well, if there's no data on the blockchain, there's no real data on 
you know, that miners have either because they're just validating zero knowledge proofs or ring signatures depending on what the protocol is. There's still data here with exchanges. So maybe government is happy that these networks run as long as there's still data with exchanges, right? And they can get crime fighting information from exchanges. But what if exchanges disappear too? And this is also happening thanks to decentralized exchange. And does a decentralized exchange like um, AirSwap or whatever, do they fit the definition of money services business? Who even is they? If it was really a properly decentralized exchange, there isn't even a they. There's just the people that wrote the smart contracts that actually allow for the decentralized exchange. Now, my argument, and we've made this to FinCEN and to others, is no, they don't fit the definition of money services business because they don't accept and transmit. Because that's exactly the point of building a decentralized exchange is to be non-custodial. If you're willing to let someone else accept your Bitcoin and transmit back to you Ether in an exchange or to somebody else, then you might as well use Kraken. If you don't want a third party involved, you want to retain custody of your coins through the exchange, then you use something more like Shapeshift or, or any other non-custodial exchange. So if there aren't exchanges that fit the definition of money services business and there aren't records on the blockchain and the miners don't have any useful records, is this a going dark situation for law enforcement? Will they suddenly lose all visibility into transactions and what will be their reaction? I mean, one thing I would say is, well, no, we're just going back to that first slide where most transactions were done in cash and there weren't records of them. The 1940s was not a time like rife with a bunch of crime and money laundering any more than today, I think. So maybe a cash economy is actually not a disaster for law enforcement. They'll just need to be better at finding and fighting crime in more old-fashioned methods. But that's not always provocative. So what if government decides, well, there is still somebody in the middle of all these transactions. There's the people that write the software that powers the decentralized protocol. Can they basically say, hey, software developer, you got to find a way to save some information about the people that use your software, like a backdoor, a key escrow kind of thing, and report it to us. Is that constitutional? And what if they say, if you don't do this, if you don't support that backdoor, you're simply not allowed to publish the software? Well, remember our reasonable expectations of privacy. If information about me is being collected on a non-voluntary basis because the software I use has a back door, our argument is that yes, you still have a reasonable expectation of privacy in that data. Even though a third party might now have it, you did not voluntarily hand it over to them and they do not have a legitimate business purpose seeking that information. And this would apply not just to software developers, but also to, say, a node on the Lightning Network. If there was some surreptitious data collection from that node under pressure from government, you didn't voluntarily provide that information, and we know how the Lightning Network works. It does not have a legitimate purpose to include additional information, like my name and home address in the protocol. That would actually make the protocol not work, because it'd just be bloat and garbage. So there's no legitimate business purpose for the collection of that information. And that means that it doesn't match these two. If you try to regulate a node on the Lightning Network as a money services business, if you try to regulate a software developer as a money services business, they have no legitimate business purpose to keep the records you're asking them to keep, and that information will not be voluntarily provided. Unless somebody says, I'm designing a cryptocurrency with a back door in it, voluntarily use it. Then it would be voluntarily provided, but I don't think anyone's gonna use that cryptocurrency for the right reasons. So this is actually strong constitutional law, I think. We can make these arguments and they can be provocative. They could even potentially win in court if we need to. Um, what's interesting is in a recent case called Carpenter v. United States, the Supreme Court started narrowing the third party doctrine, the exception from the warrant requirement when you hand your information over to a third party. The Supreme Court said, you know, when cell phone um, providers collect your location data on, from your cell phone, which they do all the time, unless you're taking extraordinary steps, AT&T and Verizon know where you are at all times, exactly where you are, because they can triangulate your location from three cell towers. The court said, you know, actually that information, your location, 
It's not something that the person with the cell phone voluntarily provides to the cell company. And that's kind of true, I mean, because most people don't realize that they're providing that much information about their location to Verizon, so it's not really voluntarily. And the court also said, you know, they don't really have a legitimate business purpose to collect that information, which is funny because actually knowing where your subscribers are all the time would probably help you figure out how to build better cell towers. But what they meant is that's not central to the service that they're selling. They're selling you can send email while traveling on your smartphone. They're not selling and will know where you are all the time. So it's not really part of their core legitimate business purpose. And so the court said fantastically that a warrant is required for law enforcement to go to a cell phone provider and get location history data on a subscriber, even though that information was already shared with a third party. So this is the first time the court started narrowing the third party doctrine, which means strengthening the warrant requirement, which is really good news. You know, and regardless of how you feel about the court, this was a good decision for privacy and human dignity. And so I think we can make the same case with respect to lightning nodes, software developers. And so I think we actually have really strong constitutional ground to stand on if they come for these people and try to regulate them as money services businesses. We could say, no, that would be an, a, a warrantless bulk collection of data. You can't do that. Now, there's another argument we can make constitutionally that I'm not gonna spend as much time on because um, before we wrote this report, very few people had talked about the Fourth Amendment in, in relation to cryptocurrencies and money services businesses regulation. A lot of people have previously talked about the First Amendment, which is your freedom of speech. And this argument, in a nutshell, goes like this. Um, when the government goes to the lightning node or goes to the software developer and says, hey, you have to write your software this way, such that it collects this extraneous information about the users of the network for crime-fighting purposes. What they're really doing is they're forcing, they're compelling the software developer to write code a certain way. They're compelling the member of the Lightning Network to change the nature of their freedom of association, if, you're, if you will, to change the nature of what they'd otherwise be voluntarily doing. And that is probably unconstitutional as, as a First Amendment principle because it's compelled speech. And you know, if, if the software developer refused and said, I'm not gonna put the back door in my code, they'd say, well, they'd have to say, well, then we'll ban the distribution of your code. And that's also obviously a prior restraint on the publication of speech, because code is speech. Now, we've fought these battles before with regard to strong encryption. Uh, Adam Back actually used to publish uh, or, or print a t-shirt that had RSA described in Perl and also in a, I, I don't know how you actually read this barcode, but that's basically the protocol for RSA. And he published it on a t-shirt because for a time, RSA and other strong encryption algorithms were deemed to be munitions. And the US government says you can't export them out of the US because if you do, you're exporting munitions to our enemies. And that's obviously a violation of our free speech rights because what if I'm doing academic research into these things? I want to publish. I want peer review. You can't tell me I can't publish my scientific research. And the thing about the t-shirt that's funny is if you walked across the US-Mexico border wearing this t-shirt, you were exporting munitions. It makes it look obviously absurd. So the First Amendment issues here are, I think, actually n harder to deal with than the Fourth Amendment issues in, as far as defending ourselves from overzealous government. And that's because Unfortunately, a number of courts have classified software development not as free speech, but as expressive conduct, like flag burning or nude dancing. And the standards for when the government is allowed to restrict conduct rather than speech are much broader. Government's usually allowed to say like, well, flag burning is dangerous, so we'll let you do it occasionally as a statement of your speech goals, but you can only do it under these conditions. You can only have new dancing under these conditions. So laws tend to be constitutional when the thing they're regulating is classified as conduct, not speech. And if this is interesting to you, take a snapshot of this slide. This is sort of the current state of the law. Most of the lower courts have said that writing code is conduct, not speech. The Ninth Circuit out in California is the really only good one. 
And the Supreme Court has yet to rule on this question, so it's split between the circuits. But the Supreme Court has says that raw data about prescriptions that are prescribed by doctors being traded is free speech, which is an amazingly broad case that says basically any kind of data is speech and therefore worthy of protection. So some of the case law is good down here in the bottom. A lot of it is bad. So I'm just about out of time. I'm going to put this back up. If you're interested in these constitutional arguments, check out the report. It's got all of the case law. And um, briefly, I'll just say, what are regulators thinking? Regulators are actually right now very friendly. So this is a, a commissioner at the CFTC who basically said, we're not here to regulate the actual authors of smart contract code if all they're doing is writing code. And he, the, he actually published that to our website because we reached out and said, you said this other thing that didn't sound quite like that. Is that really what you meant? And he said, no, I meant, yeah, if you're just writing code, it's protected. And on the anti-money laundering front, FinCEN's recent guidance in May 2019 actually agreed with our perspectives, as I said earlier, that decentralized exchanges, developers of privacy protecting cryptocurrencies are not money services businesses, and then so did the FATF, the Financial Action Task Force. So right now, the policy being exported to the rest of the world is exactly the policy we want as a community. It doesn't try to overregulate these individuals. But that could change. It could change in a heartbeat, especially if something terrible happened and Congress was moved to act. And so with that, thank you so much. I don't think we have time for questions up here, but please feel free to find me, you know, for the next uh, half hour or hour I'll be around. Yeah.